Good evening. Welcome to worship this evening as we begin our Lenten journey. Uh, the plan as of now, we are going to have this service live Wednesday night, of course, and Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday as regular scheduled worship services. I'll be putting something out on Wednesdays throughout Lent on the internet as far as um, uh, feeding you guys spiritually through the Lenten season. Uh, we begin with a responsive reading, and I'm, I'll show you a little bit. It gets a little bit darker for you guys to read and a little bit lighter for me to read. So let's, let's begin with our responsive reading. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And darkness was over the face of the deep. And the man became a living creature. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. She took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her and ate. Cursed is the ground because of you. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. The light shines in the darkness. Let us rise as we sing together, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. Our confession of sin today is from St. Augustine, a document written in somewhere in his lifetime, 354 to 430. So we're going way back before the Reformation for this one. Let's read this together. O Lord, the house of my soul is narrow. Enlarge it that you may enter in. It is ruinous. O repair it. It displeases your sight. I confess it. I know. But who shall cleanse it? To whom shall I cry but to you? Cleanse me from my secret faults, O Lord, and spare your servant from strange sins. The Declaration of Grace is from Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. And we confess our faith together using Uh, Luther's meaning to the first article of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. What does this mean? I believe that God has created me and all that exists. He has given to me and still sustains my body and soul. 
my senses and all my members, my reason and all the powers of my soul. I believe that he gives me food and clothing, home and family, and all material blessings, that he daily provides abundantly for all the needs of my life, protects me from all danger, and guards and keeps me from all evil. I believe that he does this because of his fatherly and divine goodness and mercy, without any merit or worthiness in me. For all this, I should thank, praise, serve, and obey him. This is most certainly true. Amen. You may be seated. Our first scripture reading today is from Psalm 51. The Mighty One, God the Lord, speaks and summons the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God shines forth. Our God comes. He does not keep silence. Before Him is a devouring fire, around Him a mighty tempest. He calls to the heavens above and to the earth that He may judge His people. Gather to me my faithful ones, who made a covenant with me by sacrifice. The heavens declare His righteousness, for God Himself is judge. Selah. And our epistle lesson is from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 15 through chapter 6, verse 13. Since we have such a hope, we are very bold, not like Moses who would put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end. Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart, but we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word, but by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants, for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, Let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Let us rise and sing together. God's word is our great heritage. Gospel for today is from the book of Luke, chapter 4, the first 13 verses. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness. For forty days, being tempted by the devil, and he ate nothing during those days, and when they were ended, he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. And the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time, and said to him, To you I will give all this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. And Jesus answered him, It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. And he took him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. 
For it is written, He will command His angels concerning you to guard you. And the and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, It is said, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. Here ends the reading of God's word. Heavenly Father, we do pray that as we hear this word proclaimed today, that it would fall on our hearts in such a way we can grow closer to you. We have a better understanding of who we are as your, your people and who you are as our God. We pray this in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. You may be seated. We begin our Lenten journey. Um, I, I stepped away from the Gospel of Mark just because... So much of Ash Wednesday comes out of our sinful condition. The reminder from the Genesis part where we were doing our, our responsive reading when we began of how we are dust. From dust we came to dust we shall return. All of that began with our induction into sin all the way back with Adam and Eve. And we have inherited that state Ash Wednesday, a time when we remember that sinful state, when we focus on it, maybe even with such the idea as Lent has derived over the years to try to abstain from something specific. I think originally probably something uh, sinful. Um, lately, it seems like the world has turned to chocolate. That's what everybody seems to want to give up for about three days. Um, I've always been an advocate for adding something rather than taking something away, adding time in the Word of God. Spend some more time during Lent uh, focusing your heart on God's Word. But as we begin here in the text, this is just after Jesus is baptized at the very beginning of his ministry. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Um, Jesus baptized in his baptism, receives the Holy Spirit, just as in our baptisms we receive the Holy Spirit. He is filled with the Holy Spirit, and in this verse, led by the Holy Spirit. Things that we can look to in our own lives and seek the guidance of the Holy Spirit for us. Jesus here is led into the wilderness, and this would be the same wilderness of the Old Testament wanderings and the, the numbers, grumblers, stories of after they were led out of Egypt and everybody was whining and complaining to God. Not the happiest part of Israel's history is found in this wilderness. Verse 2, for 40 days being tempted by the devil, and he ate nothing during those days, and when they were ended, he was hungry. The number 40 shows up here. For 40 days, Jesus is in this wilderness being tempted. Um, it, it should incite and recall us to think on these Old Testament things that happened with the number 40. There were 40 years of the Israelites wandering in that wilderness before they were allowed to enter the Promised Land. Uh, the number four also um, is, is a big one for the book of the Judges. Uh, the Judges was a period of 400 years, and in that 400 years, the, the book states each man did that which was right in their own eyes. They left God's decrees behind and made themselves their own gods to determine what was right and what was wrong. Um, Exodus chapter 34, verse 28 said, and this is speaking of Moses up on the mountain, he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. He neither ate bread nor drank water, and he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant of the Ten Commandments. Sometimes we remember the burning bush. Sometimes we forget that Moses was up there for 40 days and 40 nights without eating as we see Jesus in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. Number 40 being addressed here, the next phrase in this verse, being tempted by the devil. Um, the different gospel writers pretty much all use different names for the devil at this point in time, but devil, Satan. Uh, from Satan, we get the word slanderer or tempter or the tester. We can also understand the devil to be the adversary. 
Basically, just from the name and knowing that Jesus was tempted, we can assume and understand that he was tested in every way possible that the devil had to test him. Forty days in the wilderness being tested by Satan. What does this mean for us? Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15 says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Jesus, who we know ultimately went to the cross to die for our sins, was tested and tempted in every way. So we know he has empathy for us in the midst of our sin, and we, he has faced the same struggle and won. Verse 3. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. I don't know about you, but 40 days without food, that would sound pretty appealing to me. <clears throat> that's, that's not what this verse is. There, there's so much more going on. The commentators, every, it seems like every year when I look at this passage, you get... I hate to use the word that I would have a growing respect for the devil, but the, the, the traps that he set are so cunning, it is scary. Um, the idea of the trap that's being set here with this if-then conditional clause that Satan puts out it's not a matter of Satan trying to get Jesus to perform a miracle so he can eat. It's, it's not a matter of Jesus' ability to show the world that he is God. This is just Satan and Jesus in the wilderness. And Satan, if you are the Son of God, command the stone to become bread. And for some reason, my human reading of that, I always focus on the miracle that he wants to happen, and I don't focus on what Satan is trying to achieve. If you are the Son of God, and technically the reading here doesn't have the definite article for Jesus, and it's, it's one of these, G, Satan is trying to humanize Jesus, which he is already 100% man and 100% God, but Satan is trying to say, if you are a son of God, then prove it. And Jesus' response, if he indeed used his godly powers to create bread, then he would have answered Satan without the definite article saying, the son of God, and been in agreement with this negative conundrum of a trap that he's been set to say he's just merely a son of God. Um, in... in in the same understanding that we might all consider ourselves sons of God or children of God. It would be belittling Jesus' place beyond who he is as the Son of God. The previous chapter in chapter 3, when Jesus was baptized and the heavens were opened and, and God speaks and says, this is my only Son, the definite article is used throughout this. And so as we see Luke Satan's words excluding that, it's a, it's a grabber to say this is not the same point that God makes when he says, my son. This is Satan saying, eh, what, you know, let me trick you into doing this so that you can be proven to not be who you really are. <clears throat> Satan's asking this if-then statement in a lot of ways is asking Jesus to distrust his father. Verse 4, Jesus answered him, It is written, man shall not live by bread alone. In Jesus' response to what Satan has asked him to do, he places his trust in his father. He says, basically, I am not going to do what you've asked me to do because I don't need to because the father has supplied my response to you. Um, the Gospel of Luke here uh, omits the rest of the quote. This is a direct quote from Deuteronomy chapter 8. Man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of God. 
sometimes in our own lives we get too hung up on what we need versus what we have been given. And whether it's physical needs like food and water, house and home, shelter, all of those things, there is a spiritual need for us to be fed and to be focused on the Word of God and to spend time in this Word. And, and Jesus, very pointed to Satan, responds with, spend time in the Word. His tool for doing this, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Jesus is, this is a holy battle. Jesus is fighting a holy war. Verse 5 continues, And the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time, and said to him, To you I will give all this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I give it to whom I will. There's a problem in the world when we think Satan has more power than he actually does. Um... I'm, I'm still struggling to figure out where the idea that this is, yes, Satan is, is here on earth, you know, but is he the owner of this earth? Is he the king of this earth? Some people believe these things like, oh, Satan is the ruler of this world. He is not. At best, Satan's argument here to try to get Jesus to sin it's an illegitimate ruler, Satan, taking on this rulership of a kingdom that he's not legitimately the ruler of, and he's usurped his authority. He's gone beyond what he's allowed to do. It's, it's like he's trying to sell Jesus all the kingdoms of the world and they don't belong to him. In Brookings' language, I'd like to sell one of you the Chetco Bridge. Who wants to buy it? You all look at me and you're like, you don't own the Chetco Bridge? Jesus is looking at Satan and saying, you don't own the world, bud. Verse 7, if you then, well, this is the rest of Satan's little trap. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. The word worship here, there's a few different ways of saying worship in, in Greek. The word worship here is to bow down or to fall down or to lay prostrate, to get down. It can also be used in the sense of stepping down or getting below, lowering yourself. And if Satan thinks he has this authority that would place God up here and Satan here over all this world, and then Jesus does lower himself below Satan in order to take charge of all these kingdoms of the world that Satan has shown him, and then Jesus would be doing the one making this action of lowering himself below Satan and therefore lifting up Satan beyond where he deserves to be. And Jesus answered him again, it is written, remember the sword of the Spirit, the word of God, the tool he uses to fight with, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. A quote from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 13, it is the Lord your God, you shall fear him and serve him, and by his name you shall swear. Over and over again throughout the Old Testament we see this. It's, it's also directly taken from the first commandment. I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. Do not place Satan ahead of anything in your life. Verse 9. He took him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, nothing, nothing is holy to Satan. He will take him to the most holy place for all Israel, the temple in Jerusalem, in, in an attempt to get him to do something sinful or to give up his godhood. Nothing is holy for Satan in his unholy work. This area of the temple, it's a 600-foot drop from the top of the wall to the bottom of the wall where we believe that this is, this is talking about. It's also um, understood through history books, the, the idea that this is where the Apostle James, Jesus' brother James, where he was killed in the book of Acts was he was thrown from this, um, this wall, 600-foot drop. It's 
there's some confusion because some people believe it was in the temple further where it would have been a lower drop but in front of the, the groups of people that would have been there to witness it. The 600-foot drop would have had not so much of a crowd, but whether one way or the other, if he fell, he would have died. Um, lest, as Satan said, the angels would come and pick him up. Another if-then condition, just like the first temptation. Verse 10 continues. For it is written, He will command His angels concerning you to guard you. I mentioned Satan and his craftiness and his ability to try to trap people. His, his knowledge of the Scripture and his ability to twist it. This if then condition that Satan has set up, if you can follow me here, is basically saying to Jesus, if God's word is true, you jump, the, the angels will come and save you, and he doesn't save you. If God's word is true, you can jump, the angels should come and save you, and he doesn't save you, then the whole of God's word would have to amount to nothing. In which case, Jesus may as well be dead because the promises of God's word, if they weren't true, there would be no point in him being there. He may as well be dead rather than live banking on the empty promises of the word. This is, this is Satan's argument at its finest. He, he's, he's throwing everything that he has. Um, and this quote of the being able to have the angels come and save Jesus comes from Psalm 91. It's one verse out of there, but the whole chapter is, is a beautiful psalm about how God protects us and loves us and in no way should Psalm 91 be used as a way for us to test God. Verse 11, And on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, It is said, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. God's promises, there are many, and there are many for you. God's promises are meant for our trust in him. When he promises us something, he wants us to trust him in what he has promised. They are not meant for our presumption. He, he does not intend for us to take his promises and said, since God said it, therefore I can get away with it. Do you, do you understand the difference? Jesus' response interestingly a little bit different um satan starts it is written right and that and he quotes psalm 91 jesus's response it is said in the esv a little bit weak um in terms of it, it is said but jesus is, is saying satan said it is written it's in the torah it's it's in the word of god Jesus is saying the source of that is God's mouth. It has been said. And the tense in the Greek is one of these very flavor, colorful tenses that expound more than English normally does. It has been said, and its meaning has still effect for us today, and it will continue. It, it, it cannot be changed. If you take a ball that's brand new and it's never been kicked, it's an unkicked ball, right? And, and then you take that ball and you kick it. Can you ever do anything to that ball to make it an unkicked ball? You can't. God's word is truth and it stands true through all time. Has been, has been, has been written versus it is said, Jesus says, it is said, not merely written, but said. When we read our word of God, understand it as the voice of God speaking to us. <clears throat> Another thing Jesus does here is when sometimes people like to take one verse from here and one verse from there, and they put them together and they say it's kind of an argument, and you have to pick one or the other, and they create this the verses are against each other. And you'll notice as Satan gives Jesus a verse, 
Jesus doesn't put another verse against it, but he lays it beside it, and, and, and he plays the verses together in such a way that they are beside each other, and, and you get the full meaning from the two verses. There's no reason for what seems like maybe contradicting verses to contradict. It's more that one verse might explain another or build upon it. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 16 says, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test as you tested him at Massa. This is Jesus' response to Satan, You shall not put the Lord to your God to the test, comes from this quote of Deuteronomy, which the quote of Deuteronomy continues. It says, As you tested him at Massa, this place. Where's Massa, you ask? Backtrack to Exodus chapter 17, verse 7. And he called the name of the place Massa and Meribeth because of the quarreling of the people of Israel and because they tested the Lord by saying, is the Lord among us or not? The Israelites way the heck back there said, is, they tested God. And because they tested God in this place, it got named after their testing. And then Jesus quotes it back to the devil to point out we're not supposed to be testing God. There's a difference in what the Israelites did all the way back then versus what Jesus is doing now. The Israelites are asking the question, is God here with us? Let's put him to the test and see. They didn't know. God is asking them to be faithful. They didn't know, so they're trying to put out a test for God. What's the difference? Jesus does know. Jesus does know. And for Jesus, if he were to test God, knowing, that's a far greater offense than someone who would test God not knowing. I could think of all kinds of illustrations with with raising children you know you set a consequence for a certain action and they you tell them if you do this then this is going to happen and then the next day they go off and do it and then it happens the punishment happens and they're like i can't believe you did that guess what the next time they do it and the punishment happens they don't say i can't believe you did that Jesus doesn't have the option of going in blind. He knows the end result. If he sins, the plan fails. He can't go to the cross and die for our sin. When the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. Every temptation that the devil had, he threw at him over a period of 40 days. And then we have a recording of the last three, which thrown at Jesus, and Jesus responds with the word of God every time, putting the devil in his place. Every temptation. What's that mean for us? As I read from Hebrews, we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness. Jesus has been there and been tempted in all the same ways. Something even more important than that. I want to read Galatians 4.4. 4. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. Jesus was born under the same law we are. He's tempted by the same Satan we are tempted by. And he is 100% man in the midst of his also being 100% God. How much of his godhood did he use to defeat Satan? Did he turn a rock into bread? He didn't. Did he bow down to Satan? He didn't. Did he jump off the temple wall hoping angels would save him? He didn't. He did not perform miracles in order to avoid temptation. He used the Word of God. And the encouragement for each and every one of us is, when we are faced with temptation, God sympathizes with us, and we have the tools to overcome that temptation. Jesus beat Satan as a man. He didn't use miracles. And then ultimately, he went to the cross to die. Not for his own sin, because he didn't sin. He died for our sin, so that we could be saved by grace through faith. Amen.
give me the next slide there, right? There we go. Let's stand and sing together the old rugged cross. Let us pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord.